Uh, this is a list that you'll see. And my idea or passion is to create stories that educate and entertain. And what, there you go. And, uh, okay. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank a couple people who helped me on this project. Uh, number one is Dr. Alan Edel, who's with us tonight. And uh, Alan is the Curator Emeritus of the Smithsonian Institute, the Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC. And as a local bit of news, Alan is also a graduate of Lakeland Regional High School, the class of 1968. The next person who helped me was Greg Agigian. Greg is a history professor at Penn State. Now, when Susan asked me to do this project, I contacted Alan and then I contacted Greg because quite honestly, I didn't really know very much about UFOs, the history or anything. And it was Greg and Alan who helped me out there. The next person I'd like to thank is Frank Conti. Uh, Frank Conti has uh, produced some beautiful astrophotography images that you'll see towards the end of this presentation. Three items I want everyone to consider as we go through the program. Number one, this is an article from the Patterson News and uh, January 12th, the day after. So this was 55 years ago this evening at, right at this time is when the events happened. Uh, the, the term I want to look at is unidentified flying object. Don't make a connotation or a connection that unidentified flying objects necessarily mean flying saucers or aliens or the like. Uh, it is just as it says, an unidentified flying object could have been from Earth. We don't know. Looking at the words that we use, such as unidentified flying object, I had a problem with this book. In my research, I read this book by Donald Kehoe, and I have nothing against Donald Kehoe other than the misnomer of this book. The book says flying saucers are real. Well, after I read the book, there was no mention of proof that flying saucers are real. The book was an interesting book, but basically it talked about his investigation and the problems he ran in once he contacted certain levels of government and the military that didn't want to share information. Second item to consider is to avoid an egocentric view, the view that we're the only ones uh, in the universe. If you uh, look at the universe, it's a hundred billion galaxies in the universe. In the Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we occupy, Earth, there's 200 to 400 million stars. Now, with those numbers, there's got to be life somewhere in the universe. And Frank Drake came up with what they call the Drake Equation which was a probability uh, study, taking a look at all those numbers and then throwing in factors such as, you know, how many stars are in the Milky Way, how many planets uh, that have, uh, or how many stars that have planets, and then how many um, that would have Earth type of life on them, the probability of it. So I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but don't look at the fact that we're the only ones out there. The last one of the three that I want you to consider is truth. And uh, I have a quote from Britannica philosophy, which says people need the truth about the world in order to thrive. It's a great quote. That's how we go from the caveman using basic tools to our technology today. We, it was a slow process of growth, but always centered around the truth. It says here, 
A dedicated pursuit of the truth characterizes the good scientist, historian, and detectives. So I wanted to do an exercise, uh, a scenario, if you will. Uh, let's be great detectives. So as Sherlock Holmes would, let's put on the deer stalker cap and our uh, assistant, uh, Watson, and just say the words, Watson, the game is afoot. And here's a newspaper article that was written in uh, April 11th. And uh, what it says is, man says UFO incident around the reservoir in mid 1960s was a hoax. And a hoax is uh, where you would deceive a lot of people, it's a trick. And I have problems with what was said in this article. The first is that the two men who said they concocted this hoax and made this hoax up, uh, their names were never listed in the article. So if you don't take credit for something, well then I'm not gonna believe it. Uh, they said they took multiple plastic dry cleaning bags, filled them with propane from a forklift truck. They sealed off the tops, you know, where the hook comes through in a cleaning bag and set them aflame, creating a fiery ring. Well, in going over the incident in Wanaku, there was no witnesses that reported seeing a fiery ring. The witnesses said it was a bright white light. And the only two elements that I know that would do that such a thing would be phosphorus and magnesium. Magnesium is used in pyrotechnics, uh, fireworks, and phosphorus is used in the military uh, in hand grenades. And they both produce a bright white light. Now, I'm not saying that that's what it was, but I just want to say that a white light of that type is produced by these two elements. Um, what, if you look at propane, because they said they use propane as a fuel, and anytime you're flipping hamburgers in the backyard with your propane grill, the flames are usually orange, yellow, blue. Blue being the more efficient uh, combustion. It'll burn at a higher rate. And what they said was that the flaming bags lifted up like a hot air balloon. Well, uh, we'll talk about that in the next slide. By the time the gas burned off, the bags disintegrated. So these guys were brilliant. We hid the evidence just by the fact that the fire itself destroyed the evidence. Witnesses said lights were present for about one hour on January 11th and two hours on January 12th. Well, if that's the case, which it was, these guys had to have a lot of bags of propane, which again, find it quite impossible. Let's look at the scenario with a hot air balloon. Yes, there is propane in a hot air balloon and it's in the basket and they're used as fuel tanks. They're connected by pipe to a burner. The burner is ignited. The surrounding warm air rises and the balloon rises. That's how a hot air balloon works. Not the fact that this whole volume of the balloon is filled with propane. And that's what they were saying in their example, which is false. The other point is understanding specific gravity. Uh, I taught at a college in Delaware, Delaware Technical and Community College, and I was also director of the fire science testing lab. And I used to tell my students, if we're gonna do an experiment, understand the properties of whatever we're going to be burning, you know, whether it be a gas or a solid. So the one thing that when I read the article and they talked about the hot air balloon and all that, I said, wait a minute, the specific gravity of propane is 1.52. And I just knew it from experimenting. And uh, 
take a comparison, helium is 1.38. So it's lighter, it's, it's less than zero, where the specific gravity of propane is greater than zero. So propane is going to drop, fall, not rise up, where we all know from experience of handing a child a helium balloon, the balloon rises. And that's based on the specific gravity. Air is given a value of zero. That's the constant, that's the standard. And the air that surrounds us is made up of nitrogen, about 70, what is it, 78%. 21% oxygen, and then you have traces of uh, water, H2O, carbon dioxide, CO2, and argon. So that is, you know, look around you, that is the air. So I have another experiment here just to show you again. Air is given the value of zero. That's the standard. It's something that surrounds us. So we have my assistant here, the monster that devoured Cleveland, and he has two balloons. On his right and his right hand is propane, and his left hand is helium. So release the right uh, propane, and it drops. Release the helium, and it rises. So near impossible what they said they did. So that's a hoax. And that's why I'm saying use the truth to figure out what really is said and what is the possibilities. So in this situation, if we continue it a little bit further, what we have is um, a bag full of propane. It drops. So one of the guys say, well, let's lift it up. So he lifts it up and then he says, all right, I'll open up the bag on the bottom and you take your Zippo lighter and put it underneath. Well, what's going to happen is probably the fire is going to go out because just like in the carburetor of your car, you have too much fuel, not enough oxygen, so you can't have combustion. So in that situation, the fire goes out or if they say, wait a minute, if I just let a little bit out, maybe we could get ignition. So if the guy who's holding up the balloon lets a little bit out and they get ignition, well, as Barney of Maybury says, Baluey, you've got an explosion and these guys won't be around to tell the story. So all through this, I want you to understand those points. Look at the words that are used. Don't be so egocentric and close our minds to various possibilities. And the last one, follow the truth. So let's look at Wanakew, New Jersey in 1966. Wanakew was established in 1918. We just recently celebrated our 100th anniversary. And it's located in the northern section of New Jersey, uh, in the northern part of Passaic County. South of Wanakew, and we'll talk about uh, McGuire Air Force Base. So that's south of Wanakew. North of Wanakew in Newburgh, New York, you have uh, another air base. Uh, they'll be contacted in the story. Wanakee's population, it's a very small town. Starting in 1930, you had a little over 3,000 people. But if you take a look at 1950 to 1960, you find that the population almost doubled. And that's because in the southern section of Wanakee, known as Haskell, a contractor came in and built these Cape Cod houses for the returning veterans of World War II minus the uh, shed roof carport. So it's just a basic house. Sorry, <laughs> let me go back. Okay, now I wanna talk about the people because this is a blue collar town. It's a working class community. And 20 years after World War II, 
the citizens, the grown-ups embraced volunteerism. My dad was one of the board members here in town. Alan's uh, parents, his mother Flora was active in the education uh, systems in our community and she was very active in PTA. Alan's father, Melvin, he volunteered to actually build the library where I'm sitting at right now. So these were people, and I'm saying this because the fact that these were kind of no nonsense people. They wouldn't come in and devise uh, or, uh, something uh, that would attract people to the town that wasn't true. Because when we look at the uh, prominent witnesses as we go through the story, these are people that are honorable, people that you know, are hardworking people. So let's continue on. On January 11th, 1966, it was a Tuesday, okay? And again, it's 55 years ago today. The sun set at 449. The actual event was after six o'clock. So it was a very dark evening when it happened. The weather, it was clear. And I took this from the Patterson News, page two, uh, where they always had the weather report every day. The temperature was dropping into the teens. Precipitation, less than 5%. The winds northwest, 10 miles per hour or less. And I want this, I want to bring your attention to these conditions because if you look at all this, you could say it was dark, it was a clear night, there was no obscuration by fog or anything like that. The winds uh, were minimal, so the wind wouldn't be moving an object as it floated in the sky. And it was dry, precipitation less than 5%. Our first witness is uh, Howard Ball. Howard Ball was the suburban editor of the news at that time. He later became the uh, chief editor of the Trends, the bi-weekly newspaper that we have in our town. Around uh, 6.20, he was on his way to Patterson, going to work, and he was running late. He was driving on the Hamburg Turnpike, and how he explains in a magazine article as he got towards the top of this hill, he saw a light from the top. And when he got to the intersection of Patterson Hamburg Turnpike in red and Colfax Ave in white, which is right here, he was stopped at the red light. So this gave him an opportunity to look at the object even closer. Now he was stopped. And what he said was the object still appeared and it didn't really do much, it kind of hovered. And then it uh, all of a sudden headed towards the Wanaku Reservoir, it went north. These cars are heading south, so he, it went in the opposite direction. When he got to work, he didn't want to talk about what he saw. He was a little embarrassed, he said. But then he got a, a, a dispatch from the Pompton Lakes um, police in his radio at the, at the, weather, at the uh, news station. And uh, he said that uh, the call said that there was an object, the UFO, and it was flying uh, in the direction of the Wanaki Reservoir. Reservoir police officer, Charles Theodora, around the same time received a phone call from Pompton Lakes saying that they were headed and they were chasing a UFO headed towards the reservoir. So this is going north now, and this is Raymond Dam. So it, I timed it as far as uh, the news article, and about seven minutes took from where Howard Ball saw it in Wayne, New Jersey, till the time where it appeared over Raymond Dam. Now, this dark or black line here represents Ringwood Avenue the only uh, main road in our town. This dark is Highland Avenue. And at the end of Highland Avenue is the Hudali Sand and Gravel Pit. Now it's called the Wanaku Reserve, it's condominiums. 
Highland Avenue is changed to Warren Hagstrom Way. Warren Hagstrom was one of the witnesses that you'll see. And uh, he was a councilman at that time and then became mayor. And here's Warren right here. This is Warren Hagstrom. This is Mayor Wolf here and here. And this is Councilman Art Barton. I, I personally knew these men. So what was going on? Why were they out that night? Well, the mayor, his son, Billy, who was about 14 years old, and uh, Art Barton and Warren Hagstrom were on their way to the Hudali Sand Pit because that's where the annual Christmas tree burning was going on. And uh, so they wanted to, uh, you know, see the event. Well, the mayor turned up Highland Avenue. This is Highland Avenue here. This is Raymond Dam, the earthen dam at the Wanaku Reservoir. And uh, he met the, the mayor and the councilman and Billy met Officer Joe Sisko on Highland Avenue across from Raymond Dam, and they saw this object. Now, Mayor Wolf says, describes it as oval in shape and about two foot by nine foot from where he was standing on Highland Avenue. Uh, other witnesses were Civil Defense Director Bentley Spencer, another Civil Defense person, Richard Borman, um, Reservoir Policeman George Dykeman, and you'll see George Dykeman soon and hear from him, and two teenagers, Mike Sloat, 16, and Pete Mulligary, 15. I graduated with Mike uh, in class of 67, and Pete graduated with Alan Needell, uh, class of 68. Now, this photograph in my research, it appears many times. And uh, the quote is, it's probably the photograph taken on January 11th, 1966, that escaped the military confiscation is what the quote says. And I've heard things like, uh, it appears to be the photograph or it's said to be the photograph. Well, by using those inference words, I don't know if I could accept this as fact, but here's an object and some people say, this is what it looked like. Uh, I haven't heard anything from an actual prominent witness to say that, but people over the years said, oh yeah, there's a picture of the UFO. And this is what they uh, refer to when they talk about the picture of the UFO. Now, look at this object here. And now look at this. These are lenticular clouds that I uh, looked up on um, the internet. And uh, they're often mistaken for UFOs. Now, I don't know if these photos were photoshopped. I don't know if the previous was a photo was doctored, but there are such thing as lenticular clouds and they do uh, create certain recognizable shapes. And these to me look like what people would say, oh, that's a UFO. Now, Billy Wolf, the mayor's son, said that the object that hovered over the Raymond Dam was uh, changed colors. It went from white, pure white, to red, to green, back to white again. Another councilman, John Schutte, described it as a brilliant white object two feet across, brilliant light that kept changing its shade. So Billy Wolf said it changed colors. Councilman uh, Schutte said it changed shade. Also, uh, George Destito was on duty at the gate here, and he said that he had to close and lock the gate because passerbys were coming by Ringwood Avenue, seeing the object, the light, and wanting to get into the reservoir. So he, he locked the gate. The uh, people uh, such as Joe Sisko, the mayor, the councilman, they went up to the top to get a view of what it was, uh, what it looked like. And they were there for about a half hour and said they had to get down because it was bitterly cold. 
if you remember, it was in the teens and the reservoir was frozen for most part of the reservoir. There was also, you know, uh, mention the fact that a, a hole was uh, drilled in the ice by whatever object this was, but Howard Ball said that that did not happen. Um, I talked to people, I, I had a person over for dinner the other night and that's what he was talking about when I told him I was doing this program. Oh, you're going to mention the hole in the ice. Okay, I just mentioned the hole in the ice. Uh, I can't prove it. George Dykeman, patrolman, uh, reservoir patrol, uh, he described it as bright, egg-shaped, and smaller than the moon. Well, I went out and took a picture of a half moon and uh, then created an egg-shaped object. Now, I don't know if he meant that it was vertically standing or as I drew it horizontally, the object. But this was the report from George Dykeman who said this whole event lasted about an hour over the reservoir. And then what he said was the object took off after about an hour and it went north and hovered for just a very short time over Lakeland Regional High School. And then it started moving south and then appeared over Hudali uh, Sand and Gravel Pit, again, near Highland Avenue, just across from Raymond Dam. And then he said it went further south in Wayne, New Jersey, in the Pines Lake area. Now, while all this was happening in uh, Wanakew, Howard Ball, remember, he was in Patterson at work. So after he got the call from the Pompton uh, police saying that there was this UFO sightings in Wanakew, he started making phone calls. So he called McGuire Air Force Base, which was south of Wanakew. And then he called Stewart Air Force Base, which is in Newburgh, New York, north of Wanakew. He called radio stations, TV stations, any uh, organization that would be possibly flying a helicopter at night. And all answered, no, we had nothing flying in that area. Around midnight, Stewart Air Force Base contacted Howard Ball and said that a helicopter with a bright searchlight was in the area around the reservoir. And uh, now we'll, let's take a look at what went on. That, that, was, that was it as far as um, this night, January 11th, 1966, the reports of the sightings. However, early the next morning, January 12th, these were the weather conditions. Again, clear 15 degrees, the sun rose at 719. The event actually occurred uh, between two and four in the morning. And the wind had uh, 10 mile an hour gusts up to 27. This is an article talking about what happened. And this was the second visit from 2.20 to uh, four, looks like 15. Uh, Sergeant Dave Sisko reported it, uh, that he saw it over Twin Lakes, which is south of Raymond Dam. Off-duty patrolman Joe Sisko and his wife saw it from their house in Wanakew, and he said it was very bright, twice the size of a normal star. He also said that he took out his binoculars and he uh, described it as having a greenish tint to it. So similar to uh, Billy Wolf saying that it changed color to green, to red and then green. But all reports, reports of January 11th, reports of January 12th. They all said there was no sound, no motors, no propellers, nothing. Whatever it was, it made no sound. And then some, this is from a uh, article that I saw, I believe in the newspaper or magazine, I don't remember which. Uh, some said that it moved at supersonic speed. It hovered, uh, it glided. 
Uh, others said that it moved faster than a satellite. Now, these are subjective terms from a non-experienced or inexperienced uh, person witness uh, who's stationary, but these are their descriptions. I wanted to include as much as I can about what people said. And then at 6 a.m., a Major Donald Sherman of Stewart Air Force Base called and said, no, there were no helicopters. So this creates another problem. First, when Howard Ball called everybody, they all said, no, we had nothing. Then at 12 o'clock midnight, there was a report saying, oh yeah, there was a helicopter with a, a bright searchlight in the area. And that was at midnight. And then six hours later, Major Donald Sherman of Stewart Air Force Base goes back to, no, there wasn't anything there. So this creates a problem of belief from the general public. Um, all through the books that I read on the subject, the government and the military uh, were poor in public relations. They couldn't get their stories straight when it came to UFOs or any type of sighting of this. And then on the 13th, there's an article again in the Patterson News and a headline, that thing appeared over Wanakew again, which refers to the early morning, uh, the two o'clock to four o'clock uh, sightings in Wanakew. The final uh, report that came from the Air Force said that it was a combination of planets. And then of course we had the midnight helicopter. So that's what they said. And uh, they said it was the planet Venus and uh, Jupiter. I asked my friend Frank, Frank Conti, who has a computer program, which uh, will track the uh, planets. So he plugged in January 11th, 1966. Uh, gave the time of 6.30, 7 o'clock. And at that time, Venus, it already descended and was below the horizon. And so was Jupiter. So these planets weren't visible in the Western sky. Ringwood Avenue and Highland Avenue, where people were standing, were looking west. <coughs> Excuse me. The reservoir is west. Recently, a few weeks ago, we had this planetary conjunction, the planets Saturn and Jupiter. I tried to get a photograph to see what that would look like, but unfortunately, the whole week was cloudy, so I couldn't get a photograph. So let's examine the event, just sit back, you know, perspective of, let's look at the facts had prominent witnesses. And one of the books that I read that Greg Agigian recommended was uh, written by David Jacobs. And Jacobs identifies and differentiates a prominent witness from a contactee. And that prominent witnesses are people typically in government, like a mayor, councilman, civil defense, and police. So they're reliable witnesses. Um, and I said before, these were honorable people um, that I knew personally. Warren Hagstrom, for example, uh, back in 1966, um, I was a junior at Lakeland. And we had this, it was a exercise in civics, where uh, the kids would run for mayor or councilman. I ran for councilman that year and, and won. And we were invited to a council meeting and you would sit next to, you know, whoever was voted mayor would sit next to the mayor and the others would sit next to the councilman. Well, I got to sit next to Warren Hagstrom. He was my mentor that night and found him to be a very honest man. I also knew him afterwards as I grew up in, in the community. Um, so these are what David Jacobs calls uh, in his book, The UFO Controversy in America, uh, prominent witnesses. 
They want an explanation. Okay. They want to go back to their constituents and say, yes, an event happened and we contacted the Air Force and this is what the Air Force said it was. Versus the contactees. Jacob says, these are people who claim they were contacted by aliens, went up in their spaceship, and they were poked at, prod at, and all that stuff that you hear in stories. And instead of going to the authorities, these people wrote books, published magazine articles, they created UFO clubs that they were the president of. And what Jacob says was they are motivated by either profit because they get paid for selling their books and magazine articles or um, public gratification, recognition, unlike the prominent witnesses. Now, corroboration in a court of law, when something happens, an event happens, the, the lawyers will argue their position and one will say, well, this is what was said or this is what happened. Do we have corroboration? Corroboration uh, Latin, from Latin means, and my reference was the uh, Merriam-Webster uh, Dictionary of Law, was that it means to strengthen or make more certain. So let's look at some of the statements here. Billy Wolf said it changed colors from white to green to red. Joe Sisko, here, I don't have it here, but remember Joe Sisko said it had a greenish tint. So there's somewhat agreement here. Mayor Wolf saw it as a bright light, oval shaped, two foot by nine foot. George Dykeman described it as bright, egg shaped, and a little smaller than the size of the moon. So the shape, egg shaped and oval shaped, very you know similar. And so there was some corroboration from prominent witnesses here. Now. There was an investigation, not by the military, not by the military, but by a private organization called uh, NICAP or the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena. And here's George Dykeman. Remember, he said it was egg shaped and uh, He's a reservoir police officer, and he's being questioned by two NICAP investigators. This is Lee Ketchum from the Washington Bureau and Alberto Paz from New York. There was also um, a uh, investigator that came from Washington, and he uh, created an audio tape of interviews that he uh, made with the mayor, uh, Howard Ball, from the newspaper and George Dykeman. This is a copy, and I got this off the internet, of the NICAP questionnaire that was used here in Wanakee. And I want to bring your attention to this top paragraph here. And I typed out verbatim what it says. And basically it says, this form includes questions asked by United States Air Force and other armed forces investigation uh, agencies, uh, plus additional questions so that um, give a full evaluation by NICAP. After the information has been studied, the conclusions by our evaluation panel will be published in NICAP's regularly issued magazine or in another publication. So <clears throat> what it's saying is we took government uh, questionnaires, our questions, and added some extra questions. And then that would be evaluated by a NICAP. And then the results would be published. And NICAP came to be uh, because the fact that the government classified a good percentage, if not, you know, 90% of the uh, UFO information. Now, these are the questions on the form. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my experience beside 
being a uh, instructor at college and director of a testing lab uh, in another company I worked for, a private company uh, dealing with insurance and insurance forms and questionnaires. I would write the training manual and teach the inspectors. We had 600 inspectors throughout the country. And then every once in a while, I got the real gravy job doing consulting work for the Hawaiian Insurance Bureau. So I got a couple of free trips to Hawaii. So in dealing with questionnaires, as much as I did, I got to be able to look at a question and decide whether it was a valid question or not. If it wasn't, I would go back to whoever created the question and then say, you know, we need to clean this up. What does the want? So I'm very particular when I read questionnaires. So these were the questions. The time of the site, excuse me, and how long was the object visible? The location, weather conditions. So all of these things we've already looked at and discussed and the January 11th and 12th. The description of, of what was seen, the size, the was it an object solid or was it a source of light? How did the object appear and disappear? At the distance the object traveled and its speed. Did the object have sound? Okay, we already established there was no sound and we discussed these other items already. Now I put in this last item myself because it says no questions about aliens, extraterrestrials, flying saucers were on the form. And that would indicate that this form was a very objective form with no leading questions. Okay, so I wanna make that uh, important to note. This was the final statement that went out after the NICAP investigation. It's a very simple statement. January 11th, 1966, citizens in Wanakin, New Jersey at 6.30 p.m. reported first a brilliant light source, then a bright egg-shaped object that hovered at low altitude in circular patterns over a reservoir, occasionally making abrupt changes in altitude. Sightings uh, continued for more than an hour. So that was their final statement. Kind of not too sexy <laughs> if, if you look at it. But as I said before, right in the beginning, don't make the connotation that a UFO, an unidentified flying object, is necessarily something from outer space, a space vehicle. All. And NICAP did that. They just said, these are the facts, and like it or not, boring or not, this is what happened. I also found in my research uh, a, in a newspaper, a heading which says, six area residents to tell of UFOs on television tonight, and it was going to be on CBS Channel 2. Well, uh, I contacted CBS and they really didn't want to give me the time to uh, me and not phone calls. But then I, I went to the um, Paley Center in New York. The Paley Center is uh, formerly the uh, Museum of, of uh, Television and Radio in New York and Manhattan. And I went there and, and I've used the Paley Center for research in other storytelling programs that I've done before and with success. However, when it came to this one, they couldn't find any film and nor could they find after they said no film. I said, well, can you look for transcripts? And they couldn't find any transcripts either. So uh, when COVID is finally finished and I could get in the city, I'm gonna go back to them again and see if I could uh, find any information. But the witnesses that were on this show, it was listed in the article, was the mayor, Harry Wolf, patrolman George Dykeman, um, Joe Sisko, uh, chief, this is um, Wanaku Reservoir, chief John Kazaza and Thomas Lawson, and Howard Ball from the newspaper. 
And now the second major sighting in October, which was October 11th, 1966. These were again the weather conditions. So for every event, I always said, well, okay, what were the weather conditions? Uh, it was again, clear. Uh, temperature at night was 45 degrees, precipitation 10%, and the winds were westerly at 10 miles an hour. Then occurred at 9.15, where Betty Gordon, her husband, Pompton Lakes uh, Police Sergeant Robert Gordon, known as Bobby Gordon, uh, to come to the front door. He uh, went to the front door and the Gordons lived at 205 Midland Avenue. In the article that I read, it didn't have an address. So I went to Wayne, New Jersey, South of here, a uh, larger library that has old uh, telephone books. So I looked up Bobby Gordon, Robert Gordon, and found that he lived at 205 Midland Avenue in Pompton Lakes. And then I asked a friend of his, a uh, man who knew him, said, yeah, that's exactly where he lived. Um, he got to the front door, he looked outside and he saw his neighbor, Miss Lorraine Barga, uh, who lived at 213 Midland Avenue, again, from the telephone book. Uh, and she had a frightened look on her face. This photograph on the lawn of Bobby Gordon's house, uh, just to give an idea, perspective of what he saw. He said he looked up at the TV tower, the 500 foot TV tower and saw this bright light above it hovering. And, uh, he said it hovered uh, over the tower and then disappeared over the mountains going north towards the reservoir. He then contacted the Pumpton Lakes police and told them that he was going out to uh, you know, check it out himself in his own family car. And he took his wife, Betty, and next door neighbor, Lorraine Bardo. They drove north towards the reservoir, uh, following the UFO as best they could to see it. And there they met uh, Reservoir Sergeant Ben Thompson. The object moved south, it was going north, but where it only hovered over the reservoir was at Wolfden Dam, which is just south of Raymond Dam. And this was around 9.15. Um, the uh, people around that area, at, so Bobby Gordon saw it at 9.15, at 9.25, people started seeing it around Wolfden Dam. And Ben Thompson was on Oh, at around 9.15, 9.30, uh, the times varied. Uh, he said, I don't know, it was 9.15, 9.30. Was on Westbrook Road, which is up above this area at Dead Man's Curve. Um, I got a transcript of a taped interview from Dr. John Pagana from NICAP, and he interviewed Sergeant Ben Thompson and this is what Ben Thompson said. First, the object was coming at him, coming from south to north. And when, after he received the call and got to this one site and says, uh, the object was at an altitude of about 150 feet based on the tree line height. He said it was about the size of a car. It looked like a basketball, it was round with about a quarter of a football sticking out. This is an artist depicted in a magazine that reported, that I read, that reported this information. And uh, this was a artist depiction of what Ben Thompson said he saw. And he said that it illuminated an area of about 400 uh, square yards. Said, after he saw it in originally, the uh, traffic started to build up because other people started to, you know, see this light. And so he turned on his red dome light and uh, started on his flashing lights. He says, when he turned on the light, the object moved away, backed off a little bit. 
And then it moved at right angles, uh, similar to what Howard Ball said before it finally took off when he was stopped at that traffic light. And then he said that it was visible for about three to five minutes and then disappeared. So it made some kind of erratic moves and then disappeared. When he uh, got back to the car, he noticed he couldn't see. The light was so bright that it blinded him for about a minute or two. After the object arrived, Bobby Gordon, or left, Bobby Gordon arrived with his wife and Lorraine Barber, and Bobby got out, stood at the reservoir with Ben Thompson uh, for about, said about an hour, but 15 to 20 minutes, this is what Ben Thompson says, after it disappeared, at least six helicopters uh, flew over, as did many planes. Thompson said he also had uh, seen the lights from the January 11th sighting uh, and an incident in March where he says two UFOs seem to be chasing each other. Dr. Pagana, after interviewing uh, Ben Thompson, he described Ben Thompson in this way. He said, my personal opinion of Sergeant Thompson is that he is a responsible, trustworthy officer who is in no way seeking publicity or has any ulterior motive behind his statements. He had reported what he had seen as best as he could and has shown complete cooperation in our authorized investigation. Now, this is what Ben Thompson said was, he said he was contacted by government officials from o Ohio uh, and this is my quote, that it was possibly right past Air Force Base because that is the headquarters of Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book was the Air Force group that investigated um, UFOs back, started in the 1950s. So it could have been somebody from Project Blue Book. I came across this morning call uh, paper uh, dated October thir uh, 13th, two days later, 1966. And the quote says, um, cops who saw UFO assail Air Force policy. The cops were Sergeant Ben Thompson and Bobby Gordon. The word assail, so I didn't know what it meant, says to attack with arguments ridicule, abuse. These two guys were very angry. And there's a quote from uh, Ben Thompson. They didn't believe us. Uh, they didn't do it the last time. We didn't have to call them. The helicopters and several planes flew over in minutes. So this was again, he had said 15 to 20 minutes after the object disappeared planes and helicopters came in. So when the reporter said, well, did you call the police? He said, we didn't have to because the helicopters and the planes arrived minutes later. Oops. Oops. There we go. <laughs> and then uh, Ben Thompson also talked about the hole in the ice incident back in uh, um, January of 1966. And then he Again, another quote, he said, Blue Book people came in and ridiculed us. So the previous slide, he talked about, you know, officials from Ohio. And that was, as I said before, Project Blue Book. Now, this is a cartoon caricature from uh, Jack Wardlow, a Wanakee police officer. And it says, I'm not even here asked the Air Force. So it came to a point in, you know, reading through magazine articles and newspapers for a year's time after the actual incident. One thing I found, Mayor Wolf, in the beginning, he was forthcoming with information. But a year later, when I read a magazine article, they said he was reticent 
about giving out information because the fact that the government didn't believe them. They were ridiculed by people and they just said, you know what, let's just keep our mouths shut and go no further. So let's take a look at what we see when we look at the night sky and, and the distance. You know? So from Earth to the moon, it's 288,855 miles. Jupiter, remember it said that the planets Jupiter and Venus in the uh, January 11th sighting is 4.4.7 uh, million miles and Venus is 1.59.99 million miles to Earth. We, as a species, have gone from Earth to the moon back again. So space travel is something that is beyond our capabilities at this time. Let's take a look at another slide. Light is 5.88 trillion miles. This nebula called the Rosetta Nebula is, these are photos from Frank Conti, 5,219 light years away. So when you look at such great distances, you have to say to yourself, if there was any being that came here to Earth, they had to have a technology that was almost godlike. We wouldn't be able to understand how they could move from point A to point B. And so the story is still a mystery. It's still considered a UFO. Nobody knows. And as Julia Cameron says, a mystery draws us in, leads us on. So leads us on to, as Captain Kirk tells us, to the final frontier. Different nebula, different galaxies out there. So I encourage you to continue search, continue this story if you find uh, reliable facts. Let's follow a path that leads to the truth. So anything that you do, any endeavor you do, always follow the truth. And the truth is as, is says here, because people need the truth about the world in order to thrive. Nobody knows, but follow the path of truth. I want to thank you for attending, and uh, I hope you found this program both educational and uh, entertaining. So thank you, and if there are any questions, I'm here right now. So, so Richard, Richard, we did have a question, actually a statement more from um, Lily Arcabasio, who says she was there um, ah. at the time. Let me see if I can get her to unmute. Hello. Hi, Lily. So do you want to Lily. tell us a little bit about what you remember? I'd really be interested um, in hearing it. It's, it's kind of difficult, of course, but I always do remember that particular time. And as I recall it, and it just seems a little odd, but the shape was more rounded than oval, but it definitely pierced down into the ice. Ah, okay. Yeah. Now, I, I know I listened to this whole uh, uh, so story. You, so you saw us. that. W and what was it? was it? Was it a light that came down or was it? Absolutely. It was a, uh, a beam that stayed in. It was hovering and it mm -hmm. came straight down and it, it created a hole in the ice and it stayed there. It didn't it, from. Well, of course, I wasn't there the entire time, but we did go back the next day 
And uh, of course it was mobbed. Everybody was trying to stay there and to see what was going on. And the police of course had to keep the people away the best they could, but I'll never forget it. I'm gonna be 84 years old. And I lived, uh, I lived up until 1985 in Ringwood. And that's where I came from. And believe me, it's a story that I tell my friends now and they don't wanna believe me, of course, most of them. But I did enjoy this whole um, article that you gave us tonight. It was very interesting. And to this day, I think it was something from out of space, whatever it was, but it was definitely something I'll never forget. Right. Yeah, and like I said, you know, we can't just be so egocentric that we close our minds to different ideas. Can you uh, tell me, do you remember where you were standing when you saw this? Well, I was on the road and I was with friends, but it wasn't right by the reservoir, the... Um, it was a smaller area. I, I, I would not be able to tell you uh, exactly what the spot was. But of course, you could see this from a long distance. You didn't have to be right there. But we were on, uh, and I can't think of, the, the Reservoir Road. What's the name of the... West, West, Westbrook Road? West, Westbrook Road, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. And... Um, I lived in Skyline Lakes in Ringwood, so I was right there. Right there in Westbrook Road. Well, well, I'm, what I'm saying is we, we saw everything that was happening and uh, we went over there. And yes. again, like I said, it's just something I'm never going to forget. Sure. Did and it's, hard, it's hard to tell other people about it because, you know, they laugh. <laughs> right, right. Sometimes I laugh and say, did I really see this? But yeah. I know I did. I absolutely know I did. Yeah, and that's what I was saying that, you know, after a while, the people in the town just kind of shut down and said, nobody believes me, so I'm not going to take it any further. Uh, and I guess we'll never know. I guess we'll never know the truth. Were you contacted by anybody like NICAP? Yes, yes, I was contacted by a uh, reporter, oh, maybe, maybe five, six years ago. Uh, oh. I now live down the Jersey Shore. Okay. And um, I was contacted. I don't really remember how she got my name, but uh, she asked me questions and I don't also remember what the newspaper was, but she wanted my feedback and I did give it to her. And she also asked if I knew anybody else that had seen it and I did give her another name, but I, I never heard from her after that. And yeah. it was amazing 55 years ago, you, you think that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. but do you know if I, I can see it as clear as day? Yeah. If I close my eyes, I can visualize the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're the first person. That, well, I did meet one or two other people, but they were young at the time and really couldn't give me any information of what they saw. Well, they well, I, well, I, I was young then, then too. <laughs> I'm well, old yeah. Now. yeah 1960, <laughs> yes, but I, you know, I was... Uh, yeah. I mean, that was pretty much well when Ringwood was still kind of undeveloped. Well, it was just right. developing. Yeah, yeah. So we were a young married couple that moved in. And uh, in 61, in 1961, I moved in. Yeah, that's when I moved into Wanakee was 61. I was 11 years old at the time. Oh, up. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll always consider um, Ringwood my home for some reason. I've been a, out of there for so place. long, but Ringwood and is always, I always felt that was my home because my children were brought up there. Sure, sure. My children it's went to uh, Lakeland High School. Huh. My son-in-law, my son-in-law, the Kapazis, if you know them. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's, they're my son-in-law, so. Pretty good. All right. Now that I'm giving everything away. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. As it is, they think I'm nuts about this UFO. <laughs> thank you but very much Lily for contributing thank you yes oh, thank you Lily. you're welcome you're welcome if you ever find out the truth you must let me know okay we'll let you know you have a enjoy
Thank so, uh, Richard, I did get a, qu a question from somebody who wants to know if there were any reports around that time of, I mean, I know that, that you had, they had people from the Air Force and NAC had their um, investigating, but did anybody uh, talk about any encounters with, like, say, men in black or um, unidentified people? Yeah, N none that, that, that I heard of. Um, the, like I said, most of my information was uh, from articles in magazines. Uh, the one, the Science and Mechanics, they ran a three-month uh, series uh, in 1967. I believe it was June, July, and August. Each uh, month, they had a different story about the encounters in uh, January and then also in uh, October. And, uh, and yeah, uh, it really didn't talk about too much of the, like a mystery behind it. And as I said before, um, a lot of people just kind of closed up. I've contacted uh, a couple people that I heard were witnesses and they never got back to me. And this was been over a year. And then even last week, I tried again and they didn't get back to me. That's my. I, yeah, I remember when you did this for us uh, two summers ago. We had the person, uh, the daughter of the guy, who, yes. the patrolman, Joe Cisco's daughter. Right. It yes. was really interesting how many yeah. people uh, just remember this event. Yeah, yeah, and Jack Wardlow's son was also in the audience then. So, uh, yeah, I've talked to them, and they said, "Yeah, my, you know, my parents said this," and. Yeah, you know, some of them even said, well, I did see something. And that's it. Even my sister-in-law, one day, she said, are you, you know, doing a program? I hear you're doing a program. And I said, yeah. She says, I saw it. So I said, okay. I said, well, what did you see? And she goes, I don't remember. <laughs> and that was it. So, you know, uh, I, I witness uh, is tough. And the, and the other thing is when... Even the trained eye, like a, a patrolman, okay? You know, Bobby Gordon was a policeman, uh, George Dykeman. Uh, they were trained to make, uh, you know, observations. But when you see something so bizarre that there's no point of reference to connect. So, you know, George Dykeman, it was egg shaped. That's the closest he could come to a description. And it was bright. Um, there's something called scotoma and the psychology is referred to as a blind spot. I refer to it as, honey, I can't see it. I can't find it. And it's sit, you know, one situation where my wife says to me, you know, go get the jar of mayonnaise. And I said, well, where is it? It's in the pantry. So I go into the pantry. Honey, I can't see it. I can't find it. And she goes, it's on a second shelf. And I get there and I said, can't find it. And then she walks over with a disgusting look on her face, walks up, grabs the jar of mayonnaise, walks by, looks at me again with this disgusting look. How many times we see something and we know what it is, but somewhere in our cognitive process, has this blind spot and we see something but then we can't recognize it well that actually that phenomenon you're describing i've heard that described as quote male refrigerator blind <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah another one if, if you ever watched that movie uh the da vinci coke uh, the uh character sir lee t bean uses the word scotoma when he's describing the uh the Last Supper, and the woman said, you know, he says, well, that is Mary Magdalene to the right of Jesus, you know, in his right hand, and says, no, they're all men, and he says, no, he says, it's something called scotoma, the brain sees what it wants to see, so there are these tricks that happen to us humans in, in our observation, and sometimes, you know, we see something that's there and say, okay, that's what it is, 
but then the processing, the, the cognitive process of our brain sometimes muddles it. And, um, yeah, that's, that, that's what happens. Thanks. Um, I did get one other question. Somebody yeah. was asking if there were any other weird events that happened in the days before or after the lights were seen. Well, you know, even over the years, people will tell me I was chased by a UFO. Yeah. And that's it. That's all they say. Or I saw these lights out over, uh, you know, in, in one area north of us. And so do you know what it was? No, I don't know what it was, but it wasn't, you know, from the earth. I know, I know that for a fact. So you listen to their story, but, you know, I always deal with fact. Yeah, I'm a very logical, I'm more like Spock. I deal with logic. And if I can't prove it, then I'll sit, I'll sit it on the shelf. I won't deny it, but I'll say, well, I can't confirm it. And that's, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay, thank you, Richard. And I do have one other question for you. Joey G asked if you recall Gary the bus driver's story. Gary the bus driver. I remember Gary the bus driver, but still, no, story I don't. Okay, so let me just see if Joey would care to tell us about it. Let's see. Joey. Ah, I think he just left. Ah, okay. Yeah. Nope, I guess he doesn't want us to know. Okay. So, yeah, um, I was. Uh, I think he's referring to it. I used to commute. I, I worked at the World Trade Center years ago and used to commute from here, uh, going into Midtown Manhattan and then taking the subway downtown. And uh, the bus driver there was a very talkative, jovial type of personality. So he always, he had a lot of stories. So I don't know which story he's referring to. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for attending. And thank you, Richard, for doing a great job for us. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, I, I know that we have somebody who just uh, added in the chat box um, that he's from Montana. And I know we had somebody from California on the program tonight. So oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's good. Uh, oh, hold on one more second from uh, Galaxy A6. Uh, hold on, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna, okay. So Galaxy A6, did you have a question? Uh, guess not, okay. Okay. All right. All Thank right. So should I close out this? Or? Yeah, I'm going to end the presentation for everybody. Okay. okay. Good night, All right. everybody. All right, good night. I usually say...